Hello, and welcome to today's IWCS webinar. My name is Connie, and I'll be the WebEx producer for today's event. Now I would like, I'm pleased to turn the webinar over to Ed Fitton, your IWCS monitor, moderator. Excuse me, Ed, sorry. Please go ahead. Well, thank you, Connie. Our IWCS webinar series event is hosted by the International Cable and Connectivity Symposium. I am Ed Fenton, a cable industry advisor working with the IWCS team. As Connie said, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen to post a question anonymously. Please feel free to post your questions during the presentation. If you wish to contact the presenter or IWCS after the presentation, you will be given the contact points at the end of the webinar. Please note that IWCS does not distribute the presentation slides from either our conference sessions or these webinars. However, please feel free to contact the presenter directly and they will respond individually to you. Today we welcome Charles Glue, Engineering Manager, Cable Components Group in Connecticut, USA, who will be presenting his paper on high foam rate chemically foamable perfluoropolymers for enhanced electrical performance. Charles Glue is the engineering manager at Cable Components Group, LLC, working to develop and commercialize new products from both a product and process perspective. Previous to this position, he was with SABIC Innovative Plastics as a member of the Commercial Development Program and Thermo Aura as the NanoWave Operations Manager. He holds a BS in Chemical Engineering and an MS in Technology Commercialization from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Charles, we welcome you to present at today's IWCS webinar series event. Thank you, Ed, uh, and thank you to uh, IWCS for hosting this webinar series um, and for thinking of CCG to present today. Um, today, I will be presenting on high foam rate chemically foamable perfluoropolymers for enhanced electrical performance, and we will go through um, both the process development side as well as the material side for um, enhanced material and electrical properties in category cables as well as, as well as other applications. As an overview of today, we're going to be talking about chemically foaming perfluoropolymers such as FEP, MFA, and PFA to enable superior electrical and fire performance through, through the reduction in dielectric constant and combustible footprint. In addition, given the specific gravities of these polymers being high between 2.13 and 2.18, foaming these materials at 50% or greater is going to provide significant weight savings and material savings in cable design. Looking at an overview today, we'll start with some market trends as well as some pressures and competing demands from material selection in cable design, as well as the plenum, uh, plenum test, harsh environment solutions, and into process information, as well as the metrics of this material. From a market situation, we've identified four areas where fluoropolymers and chemically foaming them is advantageous. From a high electrical de demand standpoint, we're looking at category 6A and 7 applications, as well as power over ethernet where there's a potential for heat rise and the need to have electrically superior materials that have high operating temperatures. Additionally, harsh environments, where there's chemical resistivity that's needed in high heat environments in both industrial and automotive applications. And then looking to the future of 5G solutions where there will be high electrical demand to enhance signal both externally and internally. Often when designing cables, there are pressures and competing demands that are required to achieve the overall metrics of the end cable. And through material selection, it is often the case where um, engineers and design teams are looking to get the most out of a cable with um, materials that have to sacrifice some performance to meet other requirements. 
One of those would be achieving fire performance while having electrical performance. So oftentimes there are competing metrics to ensure char formation or reduced flame propagation through loading levels, uh, which increases dielectric constant, but at the same time in category 6A and 7 applications, the need for a material that has a low dielectric constant. Additionally, finding fire performance in materials that processes efficiently. High loading levels can often lead to lower line speeds and uh, build up in the breaker plate. And as well, we have price and performance. So one of the things that we're looking at is by foaming FEP, MFA, and PFA, we're looking at reducing an already electrically superior material to about 1.55 dielectric, increasing a fire performance in a material that already has a, a limited oxygen index of 95%, uh, working with the processability of these materials, and then also providing this performance economically through material savings. Traditionally, the plenum space demands the use of fluoropolymers, such as FEP as the insulation. And one of the things with foaming these materials is that we are able to meet the stringent demands of the plenum space, uh, 300,000 BTU flame uh, applied for 20 minutes, and the flame travel cannot exceed five feet, peak smoke cannot go over 0.5, and the average smoke below 0.15. So we're seeing passing values with uh, enhanced electricals, the dielectric going down to 1.55, a maintenance of the limited oxygen index of 95%. And then looking at the heat release, 4,200 BTUs is um, an approximate average of a total cable design to um, pass the plenum standard. We're looking at a reduction of these materials down to 2,500 BTUs uh, with lower volumes of material. When looking at harsh and demanding environments, uh, high operating temperature is often a need um, to maintain the electrical and mechanical integrity of a cable. Um, so we have FEP at 200 degrees Celsius operating temperature, MFA at 235, and PFA at 250. We also see that low coefficient of friction from these materials helps with insulation as well as processing benefits. And then from a chemical resistivity stand standpoint, we'll be showing results from oil and gas testing later, and traditionally fluoropolymers do very well in acid and base environments. So looking at the chemical foaming process, um, this is going to happen on traditional manufacturing equipment uh, in the industry, so a single screw extruder. And what's critical is that the foam generation is going to happen at the mid to end of the screw. And what is critical here is back pressure generation. And then when we go to the die, we will have uh, cell structure control. So as you get to higher foam rates, it's critical that you mitigate the agglomeration of cells to keep them as small as possible so that you do not lose uh, mechanical integrity as rapidly. So looking at the equipment choices is it's traditional high temperature extrusion equipment with an L over D of 26 to 1 to 30 to 1 uh, and a compression ratio of 3 to 4 to 1 to help generate that back pressure and the shear to um, enable the chemical foaming process. And then we're looking at tube extrusion with significantly lower drawdown rate ratios uh, compared tradi to traditional FEP and PFA. And then what is critical here is the maintenance of your melt temperature at the breaker plate, the pressure at the breaker plate, and then based on the foam rate that's trying to be achieved, the master batch ratio to solid resin, uh, as well as the tooling selection. So the drawdown is going to be critical to help with the maintenance of the cell structure and the line speed that is trying to be achieved. So through the development of a high foam rate chemically foamable fluoropolymer, the standard has been a physically foamed gas injected uh, polymer. And traditionally we've seen that chemical foam polymers, uh, specifically fluoropolymers, can achieve about 35 to 45 percent 
foaming before we see significant cell agglomeration, which can result in the loss of process and serious degradation of the mecha mechanical properties. So what we really looked at here is the observed viscosity of the resin. And what we found that as we increased the observed viscosity, we were able to increase the number of cells generated at the same foam rate. So the monofilament that's seen to the right has a foam rate of 52%. And when we started this endeavor, we had 52% uh, foam with only 50 cells. So they were very large. After increasing the observed viscosity by almost threefold, we increased the number of cells to 153 in the same surface area to get a foam rate of 52%, which would significantly increase the mechanical performance of that monofilament as the number of cells generated increases. So here is a Gaussian distribution of the cells in that monofilament, starting off with that low um, observed viscosity. So that was an average cell structure of 2 mils um, or 2.8 mils. And we sent our upper spec limit to 2 mils because that is generally what we would see out of um, a physical foaming process as well as a um, you know, a traditional chemical foaming process, and we want to make it better. So what we did is we set our upper spec limit to two mils, and then we wanted to see a Gaussian shift left from that upper spec limit so that the average cell distribution or the average cell size was getting smaller. So by increasing that observed viscosity, as you go from the top left to the bottom right, we have decreased that average cell size from 2.8 mils to 1.3 mils. And the average cell distribution is all smaller than that upper spec limit of two mils. So one of the things that is critical in insulation, as well as other functions of cable design, is ensuring that there is self-skinning of the material. And this is so that there's no self, uh, uh, cell structure exposed to atmosphere or to the copper. So this chemical foaming process is self-skinning to both the copper and atmosphere, and this uh, is also beneficial to its um, chemical resistance against chemicals such as acids, bases, as well as oil and gas. And we've done testing to show that there is no um, saturation of the cell structure with this media, and that we saw that through cell values and mechanical retention values that we will be showing uh, in the next slide. So in this slide, we're looking at uh, the testing of the self-skinning through short-term oil and gas testing. And one of the things that we'll see is that uh, the retention of both tensile and elongation properties for these monofilaments was at 85% or greater across a range of foam rates, uh, starting with solid all the way up to 51% foam. And one of the things that we saw that was unique here is that 35% foam, we were using a traditional chemical foam formula, and we were able to maintain the tensile strength of that, of, of that monofilament at 51% as seen in the bottom right-hand side because of the smaller cell structure. So even though the foam rate was increasing, the generation of smaller cells enabled us to keep that tensile strength of 1,000 PSI at 16% foam more. From the short-term oil and gas testing as our windage, we went to long-term oil and gas testing. So we did oil immersion for 60 days at 75 degrees C as well as uh, gasoline submersion with reference fuel C for 30 days at room temperature. And we saw passing values above 65%, as well as swell going no more than 2% for both the uh, oil immersion and the gas immersion. Uh, the gas testing was very good, uh, maintaining values all above uh, around 100%. And then really critical for the chemical foaming application is the electrical performance. So through that reduction in dielectric, we are going from an FEP or PFA with a dielectric of 2.1 
and at 50% foam, bringing that dielectric down to 1.55. So with the reduction in dielectric, we're seeing also a reduction in capacitance, which can lead to smaller cable design while maintaining electrical performance, as well as increasing the propagation speed of the wire. So here in this chart, we'll see the capacitance versus foam rate. We started with a solid and then uh, assessed capacitance at 35% and 50%. And we'll see that there was a linear trend uh, in capacitance drop based on the foam rate. We've chosen three insulation thicknesses to do this testing on, an 8 mil wall for category 6A cables, a 10 mil wall for category 7 and 7A, and then a 12.5 mil wall for higher space applications that can go towards industrial and possibly aerospace and defense applications. And what is to note here is that through the reduction in capacitance at these given wall thicknesses, we're able to look at designing cables that have a smaller overall diameter, um, which can provide um, which can provide benefits in POE applications where there are potentially congested conduit and raceways given the amount of cabling that is going towards um, uh, data, data in uh, server banks and uh, enterprise systems. Uh, we also see that in aerospace and defense applications, the ability to provide light weighting through reduced cable diameter uh, as well as more congested spaces uh, trying to make uh, systems smaller all of these are benefits uh, for capacitance reduction. Here we'll also look at capacitance reduction uh, as well as weight savings um, at these wall thicknesses. So the weight savings will be linear to the foam rate and the capacitance will be linear to the foam rate as well. In an eight mil wall, uh, we're looking at 3.5 pounds per thousand savings at 50% foam, as well as a 50% reduction in capacitance. And a 10 mil wall, up to 4.77 pounds per thousands in weight savings. Uh, and additionally, in 12.5 mil wall, 6.4 pounds per thousand weight savings. So given the heavy specific gravity of FEP and PFA, we're looking at dropping these specific gravities to just above that of a polyethylene or a polypropylene between 0 0.98 and 1.05 as the specific gravity of the insulation. So in this chart, um, to start talking about fire performance, we're looking at electric fire performance versus electrical performance. So we can really see that fluoropolymers in the bottom left-hand side have a significant benefit to other resin systems in that they have a dielectric constant as well as a very low heat release. So we're able to design cables uh, with the dielectric properties of an LDPE, an HDPE, or a polypro. However, we are dropping the heat release values from what would be similar to a hydrocarbon such as oil all the way down to around 2,500 uh, BTUs per pound. And what we'll see is that this will also enable us other areas of cable design from the cross web to the foil as well as the jacketing material to look at design selection there to see if we need as robust materials to achieve the overall fire performance of the cable where there might be cost savings or material savings in those areas of cable design. So looking at the fire performance of the cable from Steiner Tunnel results, uh, we've extrapolated these results for 50% foam uh, based on results that we saw from solid to 30%. And what we saw was that there was a significant reduction in flame propagation through the introduction of foam, as well as a reduction in the uh, peak smoke value. Average smoke values were just under a what it would be to use solid FEP in a traditional low smoke PVC jacket. Um, but what we've seen is that there were significant benefits to foam when it came to flame propagation and the peak smoke value that was seen uh, in the Steiner Tunnel. 
and then to support these results are results that are from the Steiner Tunnel uh, that were conducted across a number of different constructions using fluorofoam and uh, low smoke PVC jackets and then comparing them to what a traditional solid uh, FEP insulated cable would be with a very traditional low smoke PVC jacket. So finally, I want to talk about um, cable design and weight savings. As, you know, as we move into the next generation of cable design um, and needs, there's the competing, competing demands for achieving more electrically while also having a very aware uh, sense for material savings and resource awareness. So increasing the longevity of material supply to achieve better cables is critical to the future. So one of the things that we had talked about from a flame performance standpoint is that through the use of foam at the insulation or the crossroad um, section of a cable, there may be an ability to provide uh, some weight savings uh, and the jacket. And this is through potentially reducing the overall thickness of the jacket because it will not have as critical a need in the overall fire performance of the cable. So what we're seeing on the red line here is that between the weight savings of the insulation and the crossweb that would be linear to the foam rate, there's a potential to save on, a jacket, on the jacket total weight by 2 to 5%. Uh, and as a result, we're looking at overall cable weight savings for a Category 6 and Category 6A design at around 22% if it was using 35% foam for the insulation and crossweb and then up to about 37% total weight savings um, for 50% foam in the insulation and the crossweb. So then finally here to provide uh, benchmarks uh, at cable footage lengths. If we were designing a Category 6A design at 50 per, with 55% foam insulation, um, if the 10 million feet of that cable was made, we'd have an overall weight savings of 44,000 pounds of material. And if 100 a million uh, feet of that cable were made, we'd have an overall weight savings of 442,000 pounds of material. And this is also uh, correlated for Category 6 control and local law 5 cables using uh, FEP. Fluorofoam is a QMTM2 uh, rated pro uh, material um, that is being used in insulation and crossweb, so there's some information here. And then in conclusion, I just want to focus from a material um, selection standpoint in cable design. Um, with high foam rate, chemically foamable perfluoropolymers, you get a slew of benefits from operating temperature and potential future POE applications, reduction in dielectric constant for future electrical needs, heat of combustion to meet stringent fire, uh, fire performance, such as the plenum test, chemical resistivity in a host of uh, areas, such as automotive and industrial, where cables may be exposed to harsh fluids, and then finally, limited oxygen index going back to uh, the superb performance of fluoropolymers uh, in these harsh flame tests. So with that, uh, thank you to everybody who's listening today. Uh, any questions, please uh, reach out, and I will be heading it, uh, handing it back over to Ed Fenton at this point. So thank you very much. And thank you, Charles. At this time, we will take as many questions from the attendees as time permits. Uh, first question, with foamed fluoropolymers, could this technology allow for necessary physical requirements of cable jacketing? If so, would the foamed jacket be of similar thickness to solid jackets of PVC, et cetera? Um, so I can answer a bit of that. Uh, we are working with UL at this point uh, to uh, look at uh, adding foam jackets to uh, the UL standards, like insulation uh, has, uh, like foamed insulation has been added to the UL standard, and we are currently looking at lower foam rate uh, fluoropolymer materials, such as 15 to 30 percent foam, and how their mechanical performance uh, 
is in, um, in jacket application. So we'll be looking at crush impact and abrasion to see the overall integrity of the cable. Uh, initially, it's looking like 15% uh, is a solution and the thicknesses would be uh, rated against those of what f traditional fluoropolymers, so around 8 to 10 mils of insulation, uh, and we will be uh, comparing that against uh, traditional PVC jackets. Okay, next. Are the original high temperature chemo re chemical resistance and low flame smoke characteristics maintained when foaming fluoropolymers at 50% or greater? So from a chemical resistance standpoint, given oil and gas, we're seeing yes, that is the case. Um, we've extrapolated the values for 50% foam based on our results for 30% foam. So I think something in 2020 that we'll need to look at is providing burn results at the 50% foam rate to really understand if that linear trend um, is aggressive as we uh, have extrapolated it to be. Okay. Could nitrogen gas injection foaming be used to achieve the necessary cell structure in foam fluoropolymers? Um, you know, what we've seen uh, in the industry is that uh, traditional gas injection um, is, you know, fantastic uh, at thicker walls, um, given 60 to 70 percent. One of the things uh, that we've seen is gas injection um, does not perform it well at thinner wall thicknesses, and um, those foam rates at uh, thinner wall thicknesses um, can be a challenge. Um, but I believe that there are some instances where it can occur, but it is challenging. Okay. Um, are the heat dissipation properties of foam fluoropolymers adequate? to provide for powering over twisted pair communications cables, POE? That's a very good question. Um, we are looking at from an initial research standpoint. We did do another paper at IWCS in Charlotte that did show um, that we can definitely link heat rise and electrical integrity to the operating temperature of a material and insulation. Um, and we did this through thermal cycling to 100 degrees Celsius. As for heat dissipation, this is definitely an active um, research and development program in 2020. Okay. Uh, if each of the insulation, cross webs, pair separators, and jackets are foam fluoropolymers, are there any concerns about crush or physical integrity of the cable in use and in bundles? Sure. So I think one of the things that is of definite, um, you know, continued work is the aggressive twist lays in a Category 6 and 7 cable, mitigate, minimizing that cell structure as small as possible, or potentially looking at a skinned, um, using a solid layer of skin, 1 to 2 mils, over a high foam rate chemical foam process to increase crush values would be, would be uh, advantageous. Um, from a jacketing standpoint, I do not think we'll be able to get 50% foam uh, in the next 18 months, but definitely 15 to 30% foam given initial results. Okay. Next question. What is the highest possible line speed for chemical foaming in particular, when compared to the typical line speed at 100 uh, meters per minute or higher, and the question is for cabling or jacketing. Um, I'll speak to the insulation side. Um, for the 50% foam rate on wire that we've done, we have, and I'm going to uh, revert to feet per minute, um, we have done around 800 to 1,100 feet per minute, so that would correlate to around probably 220 to 300 uh, uh, meters per minute. Um, and we believe that there's upside there as well. Okay. Next question. How does foam fluoropolymers do with uh, crush 
and impact resistance needed for tray ratings. So I'll, I will go back um, to the answer, I think, two questions ago. Uh, we're analyzing that in the jacketing perspective. Um, our mechanical retention at 15, and this is a, this is a different application using a different um, matrix for chemical foaming, but 15 to 25 percent, we're seeing positive mechanical results. Um, as for the insulation, given the tight twist lays of Category 6A uh, and 7 designs, uh, keeping the cell structure as small as possible is critical. And then when we get that high in foam rate, looking at potentially a 1 to 2 mil skin over the top to mitigate uh, that crushing uh, is a definite avenue uh, that we want to continue looking at. Okay. I am seeing no further questions, so I would like to thank you, Charles, for presenting this very interesting and important topic today. Please note the contact points being shown should you wish to contact Charles after today's event. Each of these IWCS webinar series presentation events are recorded and will be archived on the IWCS.org website. It normally takes up to two weeks for these to be posted. The IWCS webinar series will conduct presentation events on a monthly basis. Webinar events will take place on the third Friday of each month at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Our next scheduled webinar event will be on Friday, December 20th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Each of you will be receiving an announcement for the event a few weeks prior. Please feel free to share our announcements with your colleagues so that they can join in and register as well. For over 68 years, the IWCS International Cable and Connectivity Symposium has been the recognized leader showcasing new technologies in cable and connectivity products, processes, and applications. Our, ne our next 69th annual international conference will take place on Sunday, October 11th, through Wednesday, October 14, 2020, at the Rhode Island Convention Center in Providence, Rhode Island, USA. In addition, the fourth annual UL and IWCS China Cable and Connectivity Symposium will take place on Tuesday, March 24th through Thursday, March 26, 2020, at the Marriott Hotel City Center in Shanghai, China. Please visit our website at iwcs.org for more event details. In just a moment, you will see a brief survey so that you can provide us your feedback and comments on today's event so that we can further improve this webinar series for you. Thank you for participating, and this concludes today's event.